Hello, everyone. My name is Julie McVeigh, and this is Unordinary Made Ordinary, where we talk about extraordinary experiences of everyday people. After today's interview, if you would like to continue the conversation of all things metaphysical, paranormal, and supernatural, feel free to join our private UMO group by clicking on the link in the video description. And today, our guest is Sharon Millman. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I am so thrilled that you are here to share your super fascinating many experiences. <laughs> um, but before we get into all of that, would you mind just sharing a little bit about who you are? Um, well, I was born in Ohio. I now live in West Virginia. I'm married. I have uh, two grown daughters. I have a grown son. I have lots of grandkids and cats and that's it. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, that's a great. Wow. And um, I'm kind of curious. I ask this of my guests usually. Did you grow up with a religious background, spiritual background? What would you say as a kid? Well, I was born and raised Catholic, but for me, it was more of a spiritual thing than a religious thing. Um, because I was seeing things when I was a child that, you know, <laughs> most kids don't. Uh, oh. Um, so my, I, I've always said that my life was very paranormal versus normal, not really realizing what that word meant, but yeah, uh, it, it, it started when I was a very young child and then just continued and then has still continued. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so, so you would see, um, spirits then? Who had passed Actually, on? Actually, yes. I, I saw one of my brothers who had died as a baby. Oh. And I was only a year old when he died. Oh. And when I was about four or five years old, he would come and play with me every day. Wow. And I knew who he was. He had told me who he was. He had asked me to call him a different name because my mom was still mourning so heavily the oh. loss we had lost she had lost two boys it was it was michael and then stephen and um so she was just really really devastated so he told me he said don't call me that don't call me michael because okay. it would make mom cry and we don't want to do that right and i was like okay so um but he would come every day and play with me and um keep me company and oh boy we had fun we got into all kinds of trouble <laughs> and when I got in trouble he got in trouble I was like dude you're not getting out of this I don't care <laughs> this is kind of amazing I I don't think I've ever heard this before this is sort of beautiful that your sibling I think it's beautiful for parents who maybe have lost children that the sibling can be hanging out with their other siblings, you know, and. Well, when, when, when your child comes to you and tells you that there's someone they're playing with, mm -hmm. don't just assume that it's an imaginary friend because that's not the case. Wow. And that's what I was told my whole life is you had an imaginary friend uh -huh. named Jonas. And I'm like, uh, no. But you can go ahead and say that if that makes you feel better. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. Um, just even that. But we have much more to talk about and we don't have a whole lot of time. So I would love it if you could just sort of walk us through your first near-death experience and sort of leading up to that and then through your your experience. Okay. Um, we lived in West Virginia. And my parents wanted us to learn how to swim. So we went down the street to the Y. And um, I had a teacher who was kind of gruff, I guess. 
is how I would put it, I don't know, but he wanted us to dive into the pool this way, head first. Sure. And I watched all the other kids do it, but I had this dread, this just horrible feeling that no, I, I can't do that. I just can't do it. And he told me, I saw all the other kids do it and they came out okay. And I thought, okay, I could do this. And then when it came to my turn, it was like, N I'm not. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you will, or I will throw you in. And he, the next thing I know is he picked me up and he threw me in the water. Oh. And I struggled for just a, you know, a minute or two. It wasn't very long. It didn't, I, well, it didn't really seem like it. Maybe it was longer. I don't know. But I struggled and then I just gave up and I sunk to the bottom and I was laying on the bottom of the 10 foot section of the pool. And it was incredible because I was so warm and cozy and I didn't feel afraid. But what was interesting is that I could see and hear everything that was going on outside of the pool, around the pool. Um, I saw my mom, she was in the balcony on the three foot section of the pool clear on the other side and she was hanging over the balcony and she was screaming and I could see the horror on her face and it looked like she was just right above me and I heard the lifeguard um, in the three foot section with the little babies and I heard her scream the man's name and she said go in and get her <laughs> then all of a sudden I can see him standing on the side of the pool and his face looked like it was right here and he was just frozen i mean eyes big mouth hanging open just frozen he couldn't move and all the while all of this noise and people screaming and kids screaming and running and all this kind of stuff was going on around the pool i'm seeing this light at first, it looked like a light bulb. And I thought to myself, what is a light bulb doing in a pool? Mm. I, that'd be kind of dangerous. <laughs> but it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and closer. And I don't know if it was coming down to me or I was going up to it. I don't know. Mm. I just know that that light was, it, it was white and it was bright, but it didn't hurt my eyes. And I felt this incredible sense of peace and love coming through that light and you would think that someone who had drowned would be cold you know that your body would be cold I wasn't cold I was warm and I felt cozy and it was like I was I don't know wrapped in a blanket instead of dead on the bottom of the pool you know yeah. it was it was incredible um and then I heard a it, just as that light was about to touch me, I mean, it was just inches from my face, just right there. I heard what sounded like a metal door slam and it echoed and mm -hmm. what was happening. And then I felt this horrific pain. And what was happening was there was a lifeguard about halfway, like he was in the five foot section and he was training the middle-aged children. And he had jumped in and he had got me and he was doing CPR on me. Oh, okay. And so my spirit actually came back in my body. And when it came back in my body, I heard that slamming of the metal door and it echoed. Oh. And that was me coming back into my body. Mm -hmm. So that was the first one. And I was 13 when that happened. I'm guessing that you had no idea what happened to you. Like, absolutely. Oh, hey, not. mom, I had a near death experience. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, we never talked about it ever, ever. We never spoke of that day at wow. all. I mean, we never, ever. Of okay. course, I never went back. And well. I don't. <laughs> if water gets in my face it's like i cannot breathe you know yeah, so it's yeah. a, like ptsd mm -hmm. exactly it's terrible um that's just, just so what a horrible experience but i mean yeah. it's very interesting that you know your memories of all the peace and the warmth and the hmm. yeah that part was really i i 
I wish that someone would have been able to talk to me about what had happened. Yes. But, but I think my mother was just so terrified that she didn't want to talk about it. I mean, oh gosh, yeah. the look on her face was just horrible. Yeah. And, you know, I felt guilty because it was like, I did that. I made her feel that way. And I didn't mean to. Yeah. <laughs> and then I wanted to go slap the lifeguard because it was really his fault. Oh, awful. Anyway, um, I made it through, but we never did talk about it. So I never knew what it was, but, but it your, happened. Did your paranormal experiences change after that increase, decrease, or the same? Um. <sighs> that's kind of hard to say because there have been times in my life when I have opened the door and when I've shut the door uh, okay and depending on what's happening in my life sure um yep so I it, it's kind of hard for me to say clear back then I can't yes, it, it yes. seemed like it would stay the same but okay. I was so used to that stuff that I didn't even know back then that what I what I was experiencing was paranormal. Right, right. <laughs> to me, it was just normal. Yeah. Wow. I'm, uh, did you have siblings? You did have siblings? I have three living sisters and two brothers who have passed. The, the living, the siblings, did you ever have a chance to ask them? Did they have paranormal experiences growing up or clairvoyance or any of these? things mm, they're not no they're not really uh into talking about that kind of stuff with me oh wow okay okay no actually they were trying to they teased me a lot when I was a little girl said that I was adopted I wasn't normal I wasn't part of the <laughs> wow okay but, but they were teasing me I mean I know right, that right. they were yes you know, but I, I think I was different different then. in that way okay okay so gosh now walk us through the next <laughs> this is just amazing you've had so many of these experiences so when did the next one happen um well it happened in 2005 but what was interesting that happened before that was that every other year until 2005 i got hit by lightning so i had four lightning strikes Twice was ball lightning and twice was a lightning bolt. Okay. And so, and then, so it was every other year. And then in 2005 was the fourth lightning strike and that's what killed me. Oh, 2005, okay. Now, do you live in an area where there's a lot of lightning? No, we live in a valley. I mean, live we live in a valley and- huh. The mountains are all around us. I mean, we do get storms and we do get lightning, but okay. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I know that there's a meaning for the four lightning strikes. There is some meaning, but I'm still searching for the teacher to come. So to okay. explain a lot of these things to me. Um, yeah. All right. I, I like to say it's that because God was trying to talk to me and I wasn't listening. So he yanked up the volume each time <laughs> okay. until okay. I was actually dead standing in front of him. And I had no choice but to shut my mouth and listen. But I don't know if that's really the case. I know that there's okay. uh, four, there, there is a reason okay. why. Hmm. The, Interesting. The four strikes and then. Maybe you know, it did raise your frequency a little bit more every time. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so 2005. Um, I was sitting outside talking on a cordless phone. It had started to rain. And I was sitting on the back concrete steps. And there was this roof over top of me. And I thought I would be okay. So I continued talking. Yeah. And then I heard this rumbling of thunder in the distance. Mm -hmm. and then it was like I don't know two or three or four or five minutes later I hear this loud crack and the the lightning bolt hit my arm and okay so there 
there was no thunder before that particular lightning strike, or if there was, it was simultaneous to me being hit. And that was a question that's been asked me a lot. Mm -hmm. And when you hear thunder, you count to 10 and then there's the strike. Well, I'm sorry, if the lightning is right there on top of you, you're not gonna be able to count to 10 before. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that lightning hit my right arm and then it traveled under, went through my body and traveled underneath the house and it hit the transformer that was in front of our house. You totally blew it up. Mm. Um, so when that lightning bolt hit my arm, well, it left car marks on the concrete steps where I was sitting and the phone was like clear across the yard, charred you know, smoking. Wow. Yep. Um, it, it, it was a, I felt a searing, burning, mm -hmm. agonizing, horrific pain in my arm going across my chest this way. Uh -huh. And then I just came right up out of my body, just peeled right up out of me, like peeling a banana. Mm -hmm. And then I, I went into my house. I had no idea I was dead. I knew I was hit by lightning, but I didn't know I was dead. Okay. And I got up, you know, out of myself. And there I am laying dead in the grass. But I, and I could see that, but I'm walking up the stairs hmm. or floating or whatever, you know, but it felt like I was gliding. Or <laughs> yeah, gliding. Yeah. And I go into the back door and I'm standing in my kitchen and I'm looking at everything and it has this burnt gold look to it. And so hmm. I look at my curtains and they were not my curtains. Mm -hmm. mm. And then I go into my dining room and I notice all the furniture is not my stuff. And I go into the living room and there's no, nothing in there that's mine. Mm -hmm. And I hear this old time radio show playing somewhere. And it sounded like something from back in the Waltons or something. Mm -hmm. So we're talking 20s or 30s, I guess. And I'm, I'm so confused. You know, I have no idea what in the world is going on. You know, I couldn't find my family. I don't know whose furniture this is. It was definitely my house. I knew how to get around. The rooms all looked the same, but the furniture and the curtains and decoration, everything was different. Mm -hmm. And I started to really freak out I felt like I was a ghost you know well did you feel solid did you look at your hands and yeah I was solid I was okay. solid but I I don't know if I got caught in a time warp where the lightning was so strong that it knocked me back in time mm -hmm. or you know but it was a very very odd sensation mm -hmm. and I started to panic I didn't know what to do with it I thought, now how am I supposed to get where I'm supposed to get, mm -hmm. <laughs> where I'm supposed to go from here? Mm -hmm. And as soon as I started to panic, there was this huge, huge, formless, loving presence that appeared. And I knew that presence was God, but he was totally formless and he was bigger than the house. He was so huge. But the love that I felt was the most incredible it calmed me just like that. Yeah. And it was like, I'm just, I just love you. <laughs> I'm going to go anywhere with you, you know? And it was like, he just put that giant arm around me yeah. and, you know, just wrapped me up in this love that just filled every fiber of my being. And then the next thing that happened was I didn't go up and I didn't go down. He and I went sideways. Okay. And we went very at, a, at an incredibly fast speed through these pink and gold clouds. And they were breathtaking, but it was like over in a second. And then we're at the entrance of this garden. And so we're, I'm standing in this garden and the sky is blue and the air is like 75 degrees, no humidity, birds flowers just it was magnificent and then we moved a little bit further into the garden and I could see 
you know, everything without even turning my head, I could see my senses were so heightened and so aware. And it was like I 360 degrees without turning my head, but I could see very minute details from very far away. And um, there were these two young men that stepped forward and they greeted me. And they were my two brothers who had died when they were babies. And it was incredible because it was like, oh my God, I know you. And it was like this wonderful family reunion. And it was, I kept telling them, I mean, they had this real long, shaggy, curly, uh, they looked like surfer dudes is what they did. You know, that lit long curly hair with the light, this color running through it, you know, yep. and they were glowing like they'd been on the beach all day long. And, it, and they were wearing this um, uh, like lounge, you know, like uh, beach type pants and an open shirt, but they wanted me to see the weave pattern. The weave pattern of this, it was an expensive linen of some sort. Oh, okay. That the clothing was made out of. And they wanted me to see the pattern because it meant something, which I learned later what it meant. But so it was like taking a piece right here and they took it and stuck it right up like this in front of my face so I could see the weave pattern. It was a herringbone weave pattern. And I thought, well, that's very interesting. Okay, let's get on with this. I had no idea what it meant. So we walked further into the garden and that loving presence was with me. And the two of them I had one on this side and one on this side. And they actually had to tell me I died because okay. I didn't know at that point. I didn't know. I, and when they told me, I was like, oh, okay, I can do this. If this is what death is, I can do this. So then it was time for my life review. Mm. and there was a whole bunch of other people that came around and and so it was my two brothers on either side and this huge loving presence that stood stories and stories tall behind me and then all these other people and they were from all different time periods mm. um, and I knew I knew them but I didn't know where I knew them from mm. so I don't know if they were relatives or I don't know who they were but I noticed the women's beautiful dresses, you know, I saw gorgeous dresses and some of the men were in fancy suits and then there were people dressed just like us. So I, I don't know who they were, but I did like the dresses. <laughs> um, so then um, after I was done looking at all these people and they were smiling and loving me and gathering around. And I mean, it was just so much love and acceptance. I've never experienced anything like it here at all. And so there was this, it was like a screen, like a movie screen that just kind of drops out of the sky and they're all standing around me. And, and it, you know, I kind of turn my head and there's this old fashioned movie reel that had this old fashioned movie thing <laughs> going on. I'm like, uh -huh. Okay. And I'm watching my life from my birth until that day I died in this old fashioned black and white movie on this big screen. Uh -huh. <laughs> and and I'm just watching me as a little kid and it's moving in fast motion, you know, and you see everything, everybody's moving around and, and, and I was like, okay. And then it was over and that's it. Mm. I felt no judgment whatsoever. There was no judgment. I'm, I thought to myself, well, what's missing? There's supposed to be some big judgment and punishment thing going on here. And there's not mm -hmm. what I don't understand. Well, Nobody judged me. God standing with me didn't judge me. And I didn't judge me. Mm. And so there was no judgment. And that's when I learned that God is the one who judges us. We are the one who judges ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, if we look at it, yeah, because everybody's going to have a life review. So if we look at our life review and we think, okay, that happened. 
It was an experience. Yeah. And you don't judge yourself harshly over it. There will be no judgment Mm. because, you know, God doesn't judge. We do. Mm -hmm. And so I, that, that, that was a huge revelation for me because I didn't, I, I thought there was going to be, you know, I was going to get the, the big bong and <laughs> yep. you know, get into a lot of trouble, but I didn't. And so then we went moving further into the garden and I got to look around. I got to see lots of beautiful things and I heard beautiful music and I saw the glorious city. So that's what I call it, the glorious city. And then, so after that, um, my brothers are with me and there's this grove of trees over to the left, you know, to the right of where I was standing. And Jesus walks out of the grove of trees and he comes up to me and he looks exactly the same way he did when he came to me when I was 15, which I didn't tell you that, but. Oh. There was a story there, oh. but um, he he looked exactly the same. Only he was wearing a robe this time, and he was just absolutely beautiful. So when he's standing there with me, I don't have eyes for anybody else. I'm just looking at him because he's so magnificently beautiful, and he's telling me, "I love you. I'm with you. Don't be afraid." Well, that's my first clue that I'm going to be sent back. But I was like. <sighs> okay, whatever you say. (laughs) (laughs) And um, then he led me over to this wooded glen and he walked away and I sat down on the log and there was a man sitting there and he was, uh, he was older than Jesus was, but he wasn't old. And I knew that man was God. Okay. he was no longer that formless presence you know god is spirit so he is a formless presence but he is god so he can take on whatever form he wants to whenever he wants to and he just happened to want to choose a form that was not going to be frightening to me it was going to be very relaxing and loving yeah Yeah. and so he, he he took on the form of an um older I, I don't want to say older version of Jesus. Well, it was an older version of Jesus, but it was, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, he started talking to me where we were chit-chatting. And then all of a sudden he says, what would you do if it was just me and you? I was like, what? He said, what would you do if it was just me and you? And I said, I don't understand. So he said, get up and come with me. And I went with him and we walked further into the garden and he, there's a clearing. So he waved his hand and he opened up the sky Mm -hmm. and I could see swirling gases and rainbow, you know, the rainbow colors and the spinning planets and the stars, but there was no people, no houses, no cars, no animals, nothing. It was all of that. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him and I said, you know, if it's all that and just me and you, you would be tired of me after the first 10 minutes and you wouldn't like me anymore. (laughs) And he threw his head back and he laughed. And when he did, his eyes just sparkled. And so at that point, I think he realized I totally missed his, (laughs) I missed the message again. So we went back to the garden and we sat down and he asked me the question again, what would you do if it was just me and you? No parents, no husband, no children, no friends, nobody, just me and you. And I was looking at this tree. Um, I've never read the Quran in my life. I've never, I've never picked it up. I know nothing about it. And I said, God, your hundredth name. In the Quran, as God is everywhere, God is nowhere, and God is in me. And he said, that's right. Well, there's only 99 names in the Quran, and the 100th name is never spoken. And I learned that from a a Islamic, um, a professor of of Islamic mysticism. Mm. And he explained that to me, that 
there are a hundred names, but you don't say the hundredth name. And I said, well, guess what? I just did. <laughs> and I said, God said it was right. So, wow. Um, after that, um, he said, yep, yeah, that's right. And, and I started, and he said, I don't know if he put these thoughts in my head or if I was thinking them. So I'm looking at this tree and I see this, this thousand year old oak tree or whatever. And I could see the detail of the bark and the leaves, and I could see the, the roots beneath the ground and how they pull the nutrients and it goes up into the tree and the leaves do what they do. And they clean the air and we breathe the air. So everything is connected and dependent upon everything else. And that was so important. And then I said, God, I said, you made this tree. You are in this tree. So when I see this tree, I see you. And he said, yes, that's right. Mm. And then I started thinking about my parents and I said the same thing. And then my children. And I was married at the time to a person that was very, very abusive and hurt me very deeply. And I said to him, I said, God, there are people in this world that hurt other people but you made those people, you are in those people. So when we see those people, we see you. And he said, yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. And then he said, now I have a question for you. And I said, okay. And he said, what do you see when you look in the mirror? Or when you look in the mirror, what do you see? That, that was how he put it. And my normal answer would have been nothing because my whole life, uh, my whole adult life, I had was told, you are fat, you are ugly, you are stupid, you are no good, all of those kinds of things. And I was buying into that and believing that's the world's view of me. But that wasn't God's view of me. Mm. And when I thought about that, I, 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 I couldn't say nothing. I mean, who, who says that to God? <laughs> You know, that's just not a very nice thing to say. God, you made nothing. Um, so I said, well, you made me, you're in me. So when I look in the mirror, I see you. And he said, yes, that's right. And he was so happy. I felt like I'd gotten an A on a spelling test. You know, that that's how I yeah. felt. You know, I was the child and he was the father and he was yeah. so proud of me. And I was so happy. Yeah. But what he was trying to teach me was that, you know, God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't make junk. He makes each one of us exactly the way we are supposed to be mm. by his design, you know, and um, he, he was telling me that he loved me and that yeah. I was perfect being just me and I didn't have to be anything else but me. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Yep. And that was huge for me. That was just huge. Mm. And uh, then after that, some angels came and got me and took me to a lake and showed me future world events, which just about everything they showed me has happened. Wow. And okay. their message is basically these things do not have to happen. Oh, but okay. if you if you human beings don't change your ways, they will in fact happen and they have so the message is we're the ones that control this kind of stuff that's going on in the world the wars and the hunger and the disease and everything else you know yeah it, the financial ruin of the, <laughs> of the world mm -hmm. we control all of that and if it if, if we stop with our collective selfishness that will stop Mm. We can change the world, but there'll come a time when there won't be time. So people need to, to wake up now and realize we need to stop now. We need to change now Yes. in order to prevent what is coming down the line. So that was, then I was sent back to my body. Um, if I had a discussion about whether to stay or go, it was probably not a good one. And that's about the only thing I don't remember. Uh. <laughs> Um, so then I, and I have, have a right bundle branch block in my heart and I have seizures, um, oh. from the lightning. Um, okay. So. Oh my. Okay. I can't believe you have two others. 
that's just so so intense okay it, are you ready to share the next one is that okay sure okay wow. okay um the third one happened um in november of 2016 and actually my book was published in September of 2016. So a month later, I had the third one. So oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have to write a part two. <laughs> yes, for sure. But um, I had um, had a bowel blockage and had to have emergency surgery for that. And um, when they were cutting me, they were in me. <laughs> I came out of my body. What happened was I okay. asphyxiated or no, uh, what was it? Um, it was the breathing tube. I aspirated. That's where I aspirated on the breathing tube. Okay. And um, I came out of my body and I saw what they were doing and they had blue hats on and they had blue gloves on and they had their hands inside of me and there was blood on the gloves. And I thought, okay, this is really disgusting. I'm not watching this. <laughs> I just I don't know. I get so I went up in the corner of the room, way up in the corner. And I'm sitting up in the corner, but I could still see. Yeah. And I thought, you know, this is ridiculous. Where am I going to go where I can't see what they're doing? When then all of a sudden, it was like an upside down whirlpool. It was big at the bottom and it kind of went up this way. Okay. And it was sort of rainbow colored, sparkly. I thought, I'm just going to go right up there and see what's up there. So I went up. And it was funny because I was standing in the exact same garden that I was in in the second near-death experience. Only this time, I was standing right next to the golden wall that surrounded that glorious city that I had seen. And, and it looked like they were, the wall was made out of pure gold cinder blocks. Mm. And it was so tall. And I'm standing there and I'm thinking, now how in the world am I supposed to get through that wall? I can't jump that high. I can't walk. I kept going through it and, and or trying to go through it and bumping my head. You know, what's the deal with this? Mm -hmm. um, it didn't dawn on me just to walk a couple feet down and the gates were open wide mm. and I could have just walked right in. And um, I heard dishes clanging and people talking and laughing. And I heard music, like kind of like, not the creepy carnival music, but it sounded like happy carnival music, uh -huh. you know? Mm -hmm. And then there was this little brown and white beagle puppy and he was jumping at my feet. And I leaned down and I was playing with him as a little boy. And he had the fattest little tummy and his <laughs> tail was wagging. He was just so cute. So I was playing with him the whole time. I was watching the garden that I had been in actually was across this meadow and to the left of where I was standing and the meadow, um, it was tall real tall, soft grass, and it had these wildflowers mixed in, and they were going like this. So they were kind of dancing in the breeze, and it was mm. just the colors, every color, brilliant colors. It was the same wow. feelings that I had when I ha was in my second. You know, the love, the beauty, the, the just, <laughs> there's no English words. Mm. But that can properly describe any of it, but it was beauty beyond beauty. So I'm, I'm, I'm down playing with this little puppy and I'm seeing hundreds of people just pouring out of the garden where I was before. And they're walking through the meadow and going into the city. Okay. There were uh, two Middle Eastern men and they had the robes on and they had the thing I don't know what you call that thing uh they looks like a sheet or something they put on their head with a band so the two of them they were young very beautiful and they were 
talking to each other and they were laughing and each one of them had their own angel that was walking behind them and was much bigger, taller than they were. Okay. And the angels were white and they had this blue light powder blue sash like thing. So, and every one of the angels looked exactly the same, but every person had their own angel. Okay. And so the two Middle Eastern men, they went into the city. There was a young man who looked like he was from New York and he was a telephone worker or a, a construction worker. He had a hard hat on, he had a tool vest with tools tucked down in it. And he just walked right by me and went in. And then there was a younger man that I recognized from some pictures that I had seen from a friend of mine and he had died several years ago. And he was escorting an older gentleman um, who was his dad. Mm. And they walked up past me and I stood up and I said, oh my God, I know you. And they just smiled at me and he took his dad by the arm and he took him into the city. And so I knew that I needed to, you know, I needed to somehow let that woman know that her son was with her. So anyway, um, after, after a while, I, I, I was in recovery. Okay. I did go back to my body and I was in recovery and I still had the breathing machine on. I woke up and the nurse took the breathing machine off and, and I asked to speak to the anesthesiologist because mm-hmm. I was like, okay, I, I've got to find out you know, can you dream during anesthesia? He came in and he said, absolutely not. I give you a concoction of medicine that takes you as close to death as you can get. And then I give you another concoction of medicine to bring you back. And you wouldn't come back if I didn't give that to you. Oh, gee. So he said, you cannot dream when you are under heavy anesthesia. Okay. Why? And I said, because I was in heaven and (laughs) that's all it took (laughs) and he's flipping through the chart and his eyes are you know (laughs) looking at me and next thing I know he's out the door and he won't come back in and talk to me so I asked my surgeon the same thing and his response was exactly the same so I had two doctors that were really afraid of the whole thing yeah um (laughs) <laughs> I did talk to the nurses and I, they understood. And um, mm-hmm. when I got back to my room, I picked up my phone and there was a message from a joint friend of mine and the mother of the young man that I recognized. Yeah. And she told me that this woman's husband had died that day while I was in surgery. And I said, I know because her son escorted wow him into the city and they're together and they're okay Mm -hmm. and then wow my daughter came over and she was very upset I didn't know what was wrong or whatever but I started to tell her what had happened to me in the hospital I told her about the puppy and she was like oh my gosh mom I had to call the police on a man down lived down the street from me because he was beating his beagle puppy to death (gasps) And the man got arrested. Wow. And so I was able to tell her this, this little puppy is fine. You know, animals go to heaven and they're fine. So that's number three. (laughs) Mm, That, oh gosh, so amazing. Wow. (laughs) uh, We're going to, I'm going to have so many questions after this. I know we're going to run out of time. So we're going to have to do a part two, but please go on to the fourth one. (laughs) Well, the fourth one um, was kind of short. Um, I had, I had in, in all the groups and things that, that I'm in, people talk about the void. And I yes. was terrified of the void. I wasn't afraid to die. I was just terrified of the void because of everything I had heard. Well, I had gone into the hospital because I was having seizures really bad. And I had a reaction to some medication and I died while I was in there. And 
I saw myself curled up in a fetal position in the bed. And I, I went up, up, up three floors. And then it was like being a helium balloon and how you just float. Mm -hmm. And that's what it felt like. But I could see myself in the bed, curled up in a fetal position. And, but at the same time, it was like I was in, I was in this dark place. At first I thought, okay, I'm in outer space because you know, what's up, 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 something up, 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 you would think it would be sky or outer space or something. That's where I thought I was, but I was wrapped in this beautiful black velvet blanket, mm. uh, this encasement. And I was, you know, I could see through it kind of like if you hold fabric up, you can see light through the fabric, mm -hmm. little holes of light. So that's what I was seeing, little holes of light through this mm. black beautiful warm cozy velvet black blanket and I knew that there were other people around me but I couldn't see them because it was so black mm -hmm. and when I looked through the blanket and I saw the little lights I thought oh those are cute those are nice I like those but um I'm gonna stay in this blanket I like <laughs> the blanket better <laughs> and I I just felt such love in that blanket I felt so protected, so cared for, so loved, so content. And I could see myself in the blanket and I was in a fetal position as well as outside of myself, if that makes any sense. And there were these um, like big, it felt like, now there was a conversation going on about me and it was either God was talking to my soul or God was talking to someone else about me. I don't know which it was, but it was like, I'm just going to hold you. I'm just going to hold you. Just, just let me hold you. You need rest. You're tired. I was so tired at that point. I was so depressed. I was ready to go. And he was like, let's not. And I, I remember these words, let's not make a hasty decision here. <laughs> And so I was just being held, suspended, yeah. and just rest. I heard the words, just rest. Let's not make a hasty decision. Let's think about this for a minute. Because if it was left up to me, I'd have been gone. Yeah. But he was saying, no, just, just think about it. And then the next thing I know, I'm back in my room. And there's a lights are on and the doctor's screaming at me and there's nurses everywhere. And it's just like, oh my God, put me back in the blanket. <laughs> um, so that was, that was, that was that one. My goodness gracious. So <laughs> what, what's your understanding of why so many? Have you come to any conclusions on that? I, I really don't know. Um, I, I know that once, once you've had one, your soul can slip out at any time. You, it, it's easier to slip out again and again and again. And I honestly, I don't know unless, you know, unless I'm supposed to tell, you know, people the different, I had someone else tell me, um, um, I, I guess she would be considered a professional, but she told me, she said, you're, you're supposed to teach the different stages of death, mm, you know, the, okay. the void, the light, the, right. You know, the heavenly realm and that kind of, I don't, but I don't know. And yeah. what I do is I just tell people what happened, I just tell the experience and people can take what they want from it. I have heard from another NDE ear that we have three exit points. So uh, options when we plan our lives, she feels we plan our lives to some degree and we have three exit points. So I don't know, it seems like you've already tested a few of your <laughs> exit points. I'm really a cat in disguise and I have nine lives. You've got so. nine, you've got nine. Um, I'm done, <laughs> no more. <laughs> um, this is just, it's just amazing. I'm, so what are you doing today because you, you have these kind of gifts 
Are you using that in your work? Any of those? Um, well, yes, but it's not something that um, I, I have written books and um, I will talk to anybody at any time about anything. Um, so you're very um, open now. Yeah, yeah very. Um, and um, sometimes uh, spirits do show up and they're just as solid as people. Um, okay. And I don't call them to me. I can't do that. Okay. Um, that's just, so if they, I, they show up, do you say, oh, hey, did you, do you have a mother that passed because she's here to say hello or does that ever happen? Somehow, and I've never really asked the question and I probably should someday ask how this works, but I just leave it up to God and the spirit. And it's, if they have something they need to say to someone, I am willing to help with that. But they have to set up the meeting mm -hmm. and it never fails. It never fails that a spirit will show up. Let me know that they're around. They got something to say. Yeah. And then I, I back off. Like, okay, you go to God. You guys work it out. Don't tell me how. I don't need to know how. You do what you do. And then the living person can get a hold of me somehow. And it never fails. Somebody will call me on Facebook or they'll text mm -hmm. me or they'll call my home. Oh. Or, they'll, or they'll, they'll email me or it could be someone walking down the street and all of a sudden, you know, with it usually within 24 hours. 48 hours, something like that. It never mm. fails. So I'm not mm. sure how they do it, but it's so it's divinely orchestrated yeah. and I leave it at that. Well, what, what are the names of your books and how can listeners contact you? Well, I have a song in the wind and it's on Amazon. And I have this one. It's called a rose from heaven. It's for children, but adults love it too. Mm. See? Wow. And I am at, these are on Amazon. You can get a hold of me on Facebook. I have a WordPress um, email address. I can give you and you can put it on there. Yes, I will um, put these um, in the video description for sure. Um, and I, like I said, I will talk to anybody about anything that they want to talk about. And um, Let's see, uh, working on a, the, the Gray Eagle story, oh. which is a very huge part of my second near-death experience. And when I told you before we even talked that the NDE is the doorway that opens you up to spiritual things. Mm -hmm. And while well, he was huge, a huge part of my life for many years, and, but he was the spirit and come to find out that he was a real living person. And I have um, oh. all, the whole story about that. And wow. so I'm, okay. well, I'm working on that. Yeah, he was actually the uh, brother-in-law of Sitting Bull. And he is buried at Standing Rock. And he was born, he died uh, June 13th, 1935. And my mother was born in July of 1935 mm. and when my mom saw a picture of him she held, held it in her hands and she says I recognize this man and I'm like really how <laughs> and okay. she said because she he was by my bedside at the hospital <gasps> the day you were born and so mm. there's a whole big story there so um, much more to discuss Sharon <laughs> my goodness gracious um, awesome. Very awesome. What I like to do, I know we're out of time. These interviews go by in a flash. But what I like to do is leave my guest with the last words of just anything you want to share that's on your heart, words of wisdom, words of encouragement, anything you forgot to mention that you're thinking, oh, I want to share that one last thing. Just remember that God doesn't make junk and he doesn't make mistakes. And no matter how the world might see you, God doesn't see you that way. 
and that he loves you so much that you are in his mind 24 7 every moment every second of every single day and if he didn't love you that much and you weren't in his mind all the time you would just cease to be as if you never were Mm. and so to know that you are loved that way and I am loved that way and the person next to you is loved that way and we can all be loved as if we were the only ones he ever created that's Mm. huge and I didn't know that, you know, when I was, you know, people were feeding me the world's view, which is very harsh. And God was saying, huh, uh, no, that's <laughs> not how it is. Not as not. as." I <laughs> so I just want people to know that they are dearly loved and they are treasured just exactly the way they are. Mm, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. I really have appreciated this time with you so thank you thank you (laughs) and uh uh, thank you to everyone watching this has been julie mcveigh with unordinary made ordinary and i hope you'll join us next time for another fascinating interview and if you enjoyed this please give it a thumbs up and if you like this type of content subscribe to the channel and uh i just hope you are all having a wonderful day or evening wherever you are on the planet we're off the planet and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.